<laughs> Not even close. Draw length is about two inches too short. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, there, there it is. What is your draw length? Like 29, depending on what boy I shoot. What is our situation, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> what is your draw length, Greg? <laughs> That's your... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Could have been the nude gay art show that took place in my room last night. That's why I'm tired. I don't know. Uh, might be. Could have been any one of those things. Could have been any one of those things. Literally. I think you are. You would be the Vince Vaughn character in that movie. Just freaking scarfing on crab cakes. <laughs> Someone's got to pay for lap dances for the big guy. Are you saying that I'm Todd? <laughs> <laughs> might be. I'm a painter. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, geez, uh, who's the other one? Oh, I was thinking I'll make of, uh, something nicer for that. <laughs> I was thinking of Zach because you have so much energy. Uh, Any other day but today, right? We are decimating the population, Jeremy. All right, we're live, so let's just. Are we gonna roll with I'll this, get this or what? Going, so we can see what we're doing here. It should show up. There it is. There we are. This is the OKest Hunter podcast. Tequila. Never pass on shooter bucks. If that's just me in the freezer. It's your tag. You hunt how you want. I can this try it. It's okay as time. But I don't have to like it. That's Derek, you want tequila? I know your throat's not feeling so. That might help. Maybe it'll help. Maybe Fill it might help. <laughs> now, you were asking about the bow earlier. Like, I don't know what the draw length is on the bow, but I can tell you what pound test is on my fishing rod right now. What pound test you is on your fishing rod right up. now? We're not going to make this a fishing podcast, but it's okay. There is a palm braid on there. It's fine. Oh, I dropped the cap. Yeah. Well, I guess you, we got to keep pouring. You got time to figure out that other one. That's right. I got time. <clears throat> Plenty of time. Cheers to Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de later. Drinko. There you have it. Ugh. This, is, this should be a smoother tequila. I lost I, the cap down there. I'm not going to. Can I get it? Let's get a nose full of that. Oh, no. I'm going to fall over. Oh, I got it. Okay. So, yeah, that's a no for me, dog. <laughs> it's a sipping tequila in it. It's a Blanco. Oh, it's, Definitely sipping. <laughs> not asking you shots. Oh yeah, it's a little. Uh, it's got some salt to it. Uh huh. Not bad, though. And if you like licking the bottom of floor mats, I guess it's okay. It's not a bar right shot. So Holly's dad's got some really nice tequila. Like it is a sipping tequila, and it is like bourbon, high quality bourbon caliber tequila where you wouldn't mix that with something. You just drink it out of this like saucer <laughs> or something. <laughs> it's really weird, but it's freaking delicious. Super smooth. I was like, oh, I'm surprised that that's tequila. To me, that's right on par with Malort. No way. Way. Malort? Malort. Come on. This is, what is this even called? I don't Don care. Julio Blanco tequila. 100% de guave. Good for you. Malort, you, my you, arse. Yeah. You boys ever been to Mexico? <laughs> nope. I'll, I'll take this over Malort. No shit. Any day. I will. So time, I would drink we'll this, this over Malort. I will oh, say that okay. other, if they were yeah. next to each other, you'd run the other this, way. The, you'd have to. But I would have. But if, if being help, someone's holding a gun to my head, and I have to drink one or the other, it's this one for sure. Yeah. There we go. That's an honest. But answer. not. But not my flavor. Sorry. I don't know when the last time the. When were the three of us in here last? Well, it's been a few months. You gotta keep yeah. switching out. So, what's your voice is hoarse and gone, so you're not gonna be a great host tonight. I'm gonna be really, I'll be the guy who came to podcast to you're say like, nothing. You're like, <laughs> that's usually my I job. What are you talking you, about? Like, <laughs> sorry, today you gotta talk. Oh, that's fine. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, you're coming here anyways. It doesn't help that I, you know, operate on coffee all day, so it keeps me going, and that does not help. No, caffeine much does not help. Mm -hmm. I got you some honey or some tea. I've been doing the little herbal tea with honey in the morning. That helps for like a car ride. And then as soon as I get in my classroom, start yapping. It's game over. <laughs> a, little, it a little bit of lemon and ginger root. Make Ooh. boil some water, throw some ginger root chunks in there. It's a little spicy. You, I yeah, will tell you. Yeah. You, you got to be real careful with ginger root. I've done ginger, ginger root uh, shots. Oh. You juice it. And ginger you, will get the, but the, the, like, oh, oh, shot oh, good things root, moving. You, you flush, you flush out your system. Oh yeah, it's like you start sweating all weird, but then you feel really good actually. Some dude at some holistic place a long time ago to get yeah. smoothies would. He's like, "Do you want a shot of ginger root?" I was like, "What?" He's like, "If you're not feeling good, it'll help you." Mm -hmm. and I was like, 
you know, try anything, I guess. I was like, oh, what the f- <laughs> just happened to me? Yeah. Ginger root and half a lemon, squeeze it in there. This one be better. This is a trapper. If, if you got a if you got a problem uh peeing, <laughs> it'll take care of that. It's a diuretic, man. It'll yeah, that's much one. sharper. Oh, that other one you had, you could barely cut paper with. This one's more for show. I don't know. It's yeah, for show. Very shiny. Actually, the trapper is uh it's a pretty classic knife, two different blades. That's a larger version compared to the one I'm used to seeing. They made they made a smaller version too. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um it's good so one. boats coming together, coming apart, going to go together. It's coming apart to go together. Uh center section of the floor is out. I have to track down some rivets and a rivet gun. Um, I got to track down some plywood that's seven sixteenths of an inch thick, not half inch, not three eighths, seven sixteenths. Why? Because it's just what they decided to make it out of. Now it's kind of an odd size, isn't it? it? Is. Like, why wouldn't you go half inch? Hmm. It would probably add ten pounds to the total weight of the boat, you know, and that might throw the towability out the window for somebody with like an electric car or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry for us. I, I never hit our. I didn't hit our music because I just didn't want. I didn't want to. That's fine. You don't have, to. have to talk over it. But we are this damn thumbs up thing. We are presented by Nosler. So head on over to Nosler. I think it's just Nosler.com. And if I'm wrong, you can just use Google and figure it out, or ask Siri or something, and it'll help you. <laughs> ask Google. Get to where you need yeah. Nosler ammunition. Ask and the goo goo. They are our guest next week, which I'm really enthused about. So I feel like I can do a better job for them on the show. Uh, <laughs> talking about their ammunition, what makes it unique and it's precision grade, high, high quality. They're out of um, they're Bend, Oregon, and they were started out of a garage and now they're a like, big player. Like know? all good companies, Pretty they cool. started out of a garage. Yeah. And you're not even a real company if you haven't started. That's right. Garage. 20% <laughs> off of their ammo, which is a Really hefty discount if you use code OHP. So um, our other partners you can see on the screen if you're watching live, take a look. We <coughs> partnered with, we announced the muck thing last week. So we're going to be putting those boots through the paces. I'm, I've been putting the clogs through the paces. I got them on now. It's getting good and sweaty in there. And uh, everyone else, we're going to start to try to do a better job just organically talking about things. Other than I know Latitude does have a uh, new like tape or grip that lights up at night, like a glows or something for the speed sticks. Turn off the lights and I glow. <laughs> and they have uh, a new color of the knee pads. So that's pretty cool. Oh, well, Greg just hates tequila. If you want to get some bourbon, you can get some bourbon. It tastes like mosquito repellent. I, I mean, I mix a little of the amber. Negative. Maybe this one's better. Yeah. I don't no, know. This one, no. That one might be better. No. Ooh, we do have no a way. guest. So <laughs> right, right, right. Let's, uh, let's get Nick on here. So. <clears throat> Nick, thanks for patiently waiting backstage. You're live with us now. Yeah, appreciate it, big time, man. It's good thanks to be on here. here. Well, I I know we had like this whole plan of how, how we wanted to talk about things, but I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and here's here's it's not a big change. We got ourselves a little mind changer here. We'll get to the we'll get to the meat of what we were talking about off stage or whatever. I don't even know what to say here. My words are trash today. What I do want to hear is how the hell you came to meet Derek and how that went. <laughs> and then we'll, yeah, that, that's we'll a watch. pretty interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I'll this... let you handle that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, geez, uh, actually met him through a gentleman that uh, I helped pack out a bull in September, Jonas. Um, and I'm not sure how they are connected, but they uh, we all went down on a hog hunt down in Texas, and sure enough, it just was like it was like brotherhood. And I mean, he's crazy. I'm crazy. It fits perfectly. <laughs> he's a little crazy we both have a pretty healthy or unhealthy obsession with shed antlers so yeah yours, yours are just a lot bigger than mine <laughs> well you do pick up your occasional moose paddle yeah i haven't got one this year but uh we we did share some photos nick and i he's obviously he'll tell you where he's from and whatnot but uh finds a lot of really nice elk sheds so i was geeking out and like nick show me all the elk sheds you got and man i think we went back and forth while we were hog hunting a little while oh, it's cool What's funny is I love whitetail sheds. I have never picked one up. Chad picked up one when we were running the dogs, and I was just geeked out, man. I mean, <laughs> I, I love those things. <clears throat> yeah, you'll have to let us know if you ever make your way to the Midwest. Not saying we'll get one, but we <laughs> sure as hell take you for a walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't mind walking one bit. The flatland will be a lot easier for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Just we'll, we'll find a nice swamp for him. 
<laughs> a little different terrain. Yeah, a little different terrain. The only shed I ever found is the one behind these gentlemen here. So I'm glad it's on display. Yeah. It's a very exciting find. I'll never forget it. It's a very strong memory because it's only one memory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have other memories to draw that one out yet. <laughs> so it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty basic. Well, uh, so you're a color. How do you, what'd you say? A Coloradian? Coloradan? Colorado? Colorado. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's close. Colorado. I've never said that before. So um, talk about your, your upbringing in Colorado, being from Colorado, what you do in Colorado. And uh, then we can get into some controversial things about legislator. legislator? Absolutely. Oh, I'm having a tough time tonight. Legislation. Guys. Yep. Legislation. <laughs> Sheesh. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, uh, born and raised in Colorado. I actually grew up outside of Denver. Um, you know, been going in the mountains since I could walk pretty much. And actually, even before that, my dad was a hunting guide while I was a kid. So it was pretty much ingrained in me to to be in the high country, you know, from basically July until November. Um, and then as I got older, it kind of took a back seat for school and sports and things like that. And then started getting back into it myself, taking myself out, going out with friends, and then uh, was fortunate enough to actually get a guiding position last year um, in Southwest Colorado. So did that, and uh, we'll continue to do that going forward. Super excited, love it. I love being on the mountain. There's truly nothing more I enjoy. Um, easiest thing to do, getting up at three o'clock in the morning to go to the woods. Googling how to get rid of thumbs up gestures. <laughs> oh my god! Sorry. <laughs> so, so, so Nick, with your uh, with your guiding this past season, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into that? Who you're guiding with, or what that kind of looks like? Yeah. So uh, the gentleman, so the outfitter, his name is Ed Schwartz. Um, actually, just kind of found him on a whim and um, just asked for an opportunity. He was kind enough to give it to me. And then um, pretty much from there, just showed up, made sure I did what he needed. He does a lot of dr full drop camps on horseback, you know, the whole nine yards. He does also offer, um, you know, essentially drop camps where you kind of just go in and work yourself. You know, we'll take you in on horses and then you just kind of work the country as you want. And that was just a huge opportunity. We took um, in total last year with everyone hunting, including myself, uh, we ended up shooting 11 elk from September till the end of November, which was great. Um, was even blessed to go on a, a hunt with the Hush guys. Um, and uh, that wasn't a guide. That was just more so helping them out and being on the mountain with them. But absolutely, like I said, amazing experience. It's great to take out first time elk hunters and kind of show them what the high country is really like and see how well they can handle it. Because it's definitely different when you're at altitude. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely is a, a different different type of environment than what we're used to. I would imagine we'd be sucking wind pretty hard. <laughs> well, I'd imagine most guides or, you know, just Colorado in general, you get a lot of flatlanders, people from the Midwest all over the country heading out there because you guys do have over-the-counter tags in some of your units. So I think you probably have a lot of people who are first-time elk hunters, and it's pretty cool that you get to get out there and help them out and show them your passion. Yeah, I will say that was a learning curve is uh, walking with some flatlanders and <laughs> taking breaks, um, you know, not trying to brag on myself, but just being raised up here. It's definitely a lot easier if you're used to it. And uh, when you get people on those steep slopes, you kind of learn how willing they are and, and how far they want to go for that elk. So, Yeah, well, it doesn't hurt that Nick is like six foot. 18 inches tall and uh, he's got quite a stride i think he grew out those dreads for so people can use them like little handlebars and hold on and drag them yeah, up the hill. yeah exactly <laughs> that boy just, moves everyone just looks. grab one and i'll carry you <laughs> yeah he moves man he moves how did you how did you like you said i think uh your dad was a guide and now you're an elk guide how like how did that did you do it because your dad did it or you're just out there so much you're like well sure i can take some people out here like do you have to get certified and at, at to what level like are you at some point you're kind of in charge of people's lives out there that's yeah 100 yeah so yeah like why did you decide to do that or is that all you do what else do you do that's uh so i primarily guide elk um there have been opportunities uh last year to guide deer but i actually didn't want to take them there's a lot 
that goes into it and it can be daunting, but actually once you understand how it works as far as the outfitter is the one that carries the license, gets the permits for specific units, and then um, understanding what the CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, expects from you, it's not, it's not too bad. It's a lot of paperwork, um, but once you get your worth it, and basically I got into it when, you know, I mean, essentially when hunting wasn't the hugest thing, I mean, it definitely wasn't as popular as it is now. And he guided for uh, up in the White River National Forest. Um, and it was more so for me getting into it. It was just trying to understand happiness, I guess, is, is a weird way to put it. But just what truly makes me happy? What do I truly enjoy? What would I picture myself doing for the rest of my life type of thing? And uh, yeah, like I said, Ed, you know, he actually reached out to me. He had seen my stuff on social media and just was like, hey, I need some help. I've only got one other guide right now. Would you mind coming down? And just ran down there. Um, you know, thankfully, it's only about two and a half hours away from where I live because I'm pretty far southwest in, in Colorado anyway. And then um, just showed up for bow season and then um, first rifle, second rifle. And then after that, it was the hush hunt and then my four season cow tag. So, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's so much more than, you know, a weekend trip or a week trip or whatever. It's, it's lifestyle for me. I, I, you know, everyone tries to do it for the meat in the freezer. Um, but it's also just so much of figuring out who you are on the mountain and how tough you can be in some of those situations. You know, second season, we had probably about two feet of snow come in on us overnight. We were camped at 11,000 feet. You know, the canvas tents are sagging everything's soaking wet and it just makes you really grit your teeth and and judge how much you want that opportunity how much you want to be there well that's happening like well it's you know so you wake up it's two feet of snow are you in that moment going oh yeah this is what i signed up for <laughs> like are you like some people might be like oh man this sucks it's so hard are you like yeah bro. i love it I yeah, love the hard work. I, I love the challenge. <laughs> Throw anything you can at me on the mountain. Um, there's truly, it's just, again, it's like, who am I going to be today when I wake up? And am I going to show these guys what it's about and how to get it done? Or am I going to kind of wuss out and be like, oh, you guys can stay at camp. Like, no, we're going out. You guys are here to hunt. You paid for the hunt. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, except for when there's a couple of Big old Wisconsin cheese curd eating boys going, I just want to sleep in. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, uh, no. I had five hunters in camp second season, and um, all of them were great. Uh, the older gentleman, Rick, actually, he struggled a little bit. The altitude definitely got to him pretty quick. But honestly, all of them, every single morning, were up at 3 a.m. We were making breakfast, hanging out. And then it was like, all right, you guys are going to follow me here. I'll set you up there. And then you guys are going to come with me the rest of the day and we'll meet up in the afternoon. Um, didn't hardly hear much complaint other than like sore knees, sore feet, you know, stuff like that. But they really, they wanted it bad. So that was awesome. It's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. I mean, when you're out there doing it, you're like, well, might as well go do it. Like you're not going to have an adventure sitting at camp. I mean, you might, a bear could stroll by or something, but, but like, well, yeah, you would go do the thing. Like if you're there. And it's very different when you do like, <clears throat> pack in drop camps right yeah. like rather than back to the truck and back to the lodge kind, right. of, kind of hunts it's it's a very different hunt so nick i'm curious do, are you guys does your outfitter have property out there private or are you guys hunting public property how does that it's all, all public it's all public land um it's uh 79 80 and 81 which 80 and 81 just started turning into a uh, draw for certain seasons um, and then 79 was already draw for a couple of seasons, but you can still do OTC rifle second and third in 80 and 81. So, um, but yeah, it's all public land. We went back in about eight miles from the trailhead on the horses. And yeah, like you said, when you get in there, it's not as simple as just getting out. You still got to get the horses rigged up. You got to get the guy's gear, you know, all that stuff. I mean, it took us, we did three trips in me and the other guide, Aaron, before we even took our hunters up. So it's, it's definitely a feat. It's got to be planned out. There's a lot of logistics to it. Um, and you know, you got to make sure people are comfortable sitting on a horse. I was just going to ask that. How many first timers do you get out there that have never been on a horse? Um, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, yeah, it's, it's kind of surprising. I mean, I don't know, Colorado, you raised around livestock. I mean, it's, sure. it's country out here, but 
I, it definitely is surprising how many people have never even sat on a, a horse, you know, for even just a little bit and then let alone getting them on a trail that's got steep cliff edges and steep terrain in general. It definitely, um, it makes you question what we're all doing up there. I can see that. <clears throat> I'm one of those people who's not used to being on a horse. I, I so. sat on one and I rode one young as a young kid but i've had more experience with dairy cattle than anything you know growing up by a farm and everything so and working for a farmer but that farmer didn't have horses my cousin had a boyfriend at the time and his family had horses so you climb up on the horse and, and go for a ride around the pasture i've done an odd amount of horseback riding i can't, I can't even would... count how many i've been on a horse a lot i don't know how that's possible or why that's a thing um that actually surprises me. My daughter did horse Things lessons. Things you didn't know about Eric Clark. did <laughs> horse lessons. I just was like around horses, but my aunt had horses. There's always horses around. I wasn't particularly fond of riding on them because they all have... So there's a small story. I was in northern Wisconsin at my aunt's place where she had horses. And she's like, well, you can take this one out. And there's a trail through the woods over there. And their driveway was like a two-mile long driveway kind of deal. And so I get on the horse and I'm like, all right, cool. We're going to go. I'm going to go and ride on this freaking huge animal. And I was by myself. And I'm like, I've never really done this before. I think I was like 16 or 15. I think I was 15 or 16. Because I remember also learning how to drive stick in that two mile long driveway. And it was like the best time of my life. And this horse, though, he got far enough away from the other horse. And they're really close, these two horses. So the other one started making some sort of horse noise, neighing. <laughs> And then the one I was on, <laughs> the one I was on started making that same horse noise. And I was like, no, no, we're going this way, pal. Like, we're going, he's like, I don't know who the you are. You're 15. You don't weigh shit. And we're going back to my buddy. And he decided to go back to his buddy. There's like a trot and a canter. He was yep. fucking, he was galloping. Great. I don't know if you've ever galloped on a horse. It's completely terrifying, and I wasn't ready for it. And I held on for dear life. But once he got back by the horse, it's all good to go. Like he was. That's fine. where you got to start using your body as a shock absorber. He was a dick, man. <laughs> that horse was not nice. He knew what he wanted. We got far enough away, and the other one did the thing, and then he did the thing, and then he was like, "No, I'm not listening. I'm running back to my friend." And I was like, "That was terrifying." That's the only time I've ever galloped on a horse, not by choice. That's great. I think I've had yeah. one experience on a horse. Sorry, Nick. This is a short this is a one. Good component of we were, hunting a we horse, were, though. Well, I had a question. Yeah. I had a question for Nick about the horses, was where I was trying to go with that. But uh, I think I was like six or seven, and we went to a friend of my dad's place, and they had some horses out there. Yeah. And it was a summer day. It was like really hot. So he's like, Well, I'm not going to put the saddle on. It's too hot. Why don't you two kids hop bareback up on it? There? So I got up on this horse, <laughs> never been on one, bareback, sitting with his daughter. She's two years younger than me. And he's walking us around and all of a sudden he starts chuckling and he just slaps it on the ass and the thing takes off, you know, not fast, but like galloping. And I yeah. thought I was going to die. <laughs> Bareback, I'm bouncing up. <laughs> Get me off of this thing. You don't have stirrups to put your feet in to, no. you, to, to rear up on your legs. She and was actually, shiny and slippery. Yeah, I thought uh -huh. I was going right over under those hoops. You can yes, hold sir. on to mane as tight as you want, though. That's like what you're supposed to hold on to. Well, she was holding on to it. I was behind her. Oh, so I was God. holding on to this little girl. Like, <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I grew up, like I said, around horses. Um, I actually had a Mustang Appaloosa mix growing up when I was a kid. I think I got her when I was about seven and then um, kept her till she passed away. And unfortunately, she was on her as all get out being a Mustang. And I got bucked off, I think, probably five or six times before I was 12 years old. But you just you got to get back up on them and and let them know you're not scared because they definitely sense the energy coming off of you. Yeah, they're an interesting animal. I mean, they'll bond with you like a dog and probably even more so. Uh, they can yep. be a pretty loyal animal, too. Absolutely. I don't get it. The people that are horse people, I'm sorry to offend you, but I don't get it. I think they're neat, and that's about as far as I'll go with it. They're really <laughs> damn expensive to feed. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's... but they're the original ATV of the West. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. That was my question, though, is so if you guys were packing up 11,000 feet and all of a sudden you get dumped on with two feet of snow, does that change how long you can stay up there? Because the food for the horses, like, you know, like them browsing around, does that impact how long you guys are able to stay up there? No, we uh, bring feed up with us, too. Okay. We'll bring, you know, a few bags of grain, um, either like an alfalfa mix or oats, something that'll keep them kind of hearty. 
throughout the days um, as well as we don't do a lot of hunting off of the horse especially like i said with five guys in camp it's just not realistic to get all of them every single morning on a horse and then take them up even further so they're more of a tool to get you to the camp and then hunt from there that makes it hugely beneficial and keeps gear off of everyone's back keeps their legs fresh but otherwise they kind of just hang out and do their thing until we do need to come down the snow in that situation it didn't change a whole lot now if the hunters were like we're done we're over this i don't care how much i paid for this hunt it's not worth it to be cold don't want to be chopping wood whatever the case you know then obviously we'd make an adjustment and get them out during that season we did have a drop camp of two guys um, i think they were from michigan surprisingly enough and they tapped out after the first day so oh, we wow. had to we had to leave our guys go get that ride down to a different spot go pack them out and then go back in um, to my guys. So, you know, it, it's definitely, like I said, there's a lot of logistics that go into it. You got to be quick on your feet and understand how to create solutions. But thankfully, most of the guys that I had out wanted to, wanted to try to kill an elk. So oh, they were willing to stay. Freaking pansies. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. I'm like, isn't it cold in Michigan? Oh, I mean, I guess I I, I, you need to say that again because I can send it to them. Who? who, who? <laughs> no, never mind. Kevin? Maybe. Pansy. Still <laughs> <laughs> dying trolls under the bridge. <laughs> Freaking Michigan. Detroit fans. That's a real problem right there. Oh, boy. Oh, Here yeah. we go. Anyway, well, this is good. So, like, oh, boy. You want to talk about the legislation? Did I say the word right this time? Yeah, I got yeah. legislation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot going on all over the place. States are having issues everywhere. Obviously, Colorado did their wolf reintroduction. Um, you know, I'll leave that one alone in particular, but there's a lot of things going on. You know, they've got the the number 91 um, bill, essentially. That's what they call their trophy hunting bill, which is just absurd, in my opinion. Um, it's specifically outlines mountain lion bobcat and lynx which lynx you can't hunt in colorado anyway so i'm not sure why that's added into there um and it just if you really le read the bill it makes us out to be just these monsters only doing it to put something on the wall um i have never personally eaten mountain lion but i've eaten the bob uh, actually two bobcats that I, one i shot and then one my buddy shot um i'm always about trying everything that you kill at least once making the best use of that animal possible respecting that animal um, but yeah, they make us out to just be monsters in the bill. And, uh, it's, it's a starting point to take away a lot of other things. There's always, you know, bears on the topic as well and things like that. So it's just a manner of standing on the right side of the fence. If you're a hunter and a conservationist and not giving up what we, what we have essentially as far as our rights. So, um, and then in Colorado, I was also done a lot towards, guns in general, you know, and even that, um, I'll kind of, uh, tiptoe around certain subjects, but the, uh, HB 24, 1292, which thankfully got shut down. It just, you can't give these guys an inch or they're going to take a mile. And right now, like I said, especially in Colorado with the stuff that's going on, we have to make sure our voices are heard and stand up as much as possible. So, uh, anybody that can research into 91, I implore you to do so. They don't really have a start date to it yet, but they uh, they actually were finishing it up towards the end of last year. So we need to we need to keep that in our forefronts, our minds. Um, you know, like I said, the thankfully the HB twenty four got shut down, so we hopefully don't have to worry about that for a little bit longer. But they keep trying to sneak things in as as the years progress. So that's yeah. uh, <clears throat> I mean that is absolutely spot on and. I, I think a lot of people understand this and, you know, go for this, but there's a lot of people who I don't think think about it that way, but things like bobcat, lynx, mountain lion, I can see where even a person who's an avid hunter may think, well, you know, not that big a deal. Like maybe we don't need to hunt those. So it's not a big thing, but in terms of conservation, like you mentioned, Nick, it's, it's that foot in the door and it's getting that first season shut down or getting that first hunt shut down that opens the door for, well, maybe we don't need to do any of these. Maybe we don't need to do this. And uh, yeah. that's just a, a dangerous slide to start slipping down. Yeah, absolutely. Give them, give them an inch and they'll take three miles. Yep. In the marketing world, we call that scope creep. 
Mm. <laughs> you take a mile. Is that when you get the big bloody ring around your eyes? Yeah, <laughs> that's a different term. Yeah, that's a funny thing. I might use that in the ad campaign, Derek. Um, well, and like I said, these bills are just so loosely written. the The terminology they the terminology they use is so broad. Like the HB twenty four. I mean, if you really read through that thing, it it doesn't make sense as far as what is actually being taken away. Um, you almost need to be an attorney to understand everything that's going on in there. And it affects so much more. That one necessarily doesn't pertain 100% to hunters. Um, but I have friends that are in the professional shooting industry. And immediately as that thing started coming up, they're like, I'm moving. I'm out of here. My, Idaho, Montana, wherever we need to go. And it's just like, you can't. You you run away and then we're going to lose the fight. Just, yeah. again, well, reach out to everyone possible and let them know how to handle this situation. You run away and lose the fight, but then the fight ends up going to another state anyway. Exactly. That's exactly what's going to happen. So, and we lost the wolf battle. Unfortunately, Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins, they kind of uh, had their voices heard a little bit more. But um, I don't know if you guys have seen the stories. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's not lasting too long. I it's think there's already two or three. Yeah, so... Um, and not that I want that to be the uh, the message, you know, obviously, again, we're conservationists, but um, to, to reintroduce an animal like that that hasn't been here for how long when we had one of the largest winter kills up in the northwest already, it's just not uh, a good idea when you talk about longevity for elk. So, well, and the whole thing, too, is like the majority of the, the large populations are in areas like Estes Park. You can't hunt there, right? Right, exactly. So if if they're taking that population into effect that, hey, we have a, a population problem, you know, in general, we have a population problem, we should bring in predators. Okay, put them around Estes Park and see how well that works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it'll help clear out some of the elk. It'll help maybe move them, move them on. But we have the same issue with whitetail here. Like our suburban areas are loaded with whitetail. And you got to be very careful where you, where you go, you know, landowners don't like hunters, rightfully so, right? I mean, you make a bad shot and a, a whitetail ends up dying in someone's pool or in their front yard or under the kid's swing set and they don't like it. So it, it, it's kind of a, it's a tough battle to, to try and wade through. I'm going to yeah. make a very generalized statement and this is by no means fact or truth but we were up in Three Lakes this past weekend for the fishing opener <clears throat> up by Eagle River, northern Wisconsin. Deer mm -hmm. populations are fairly low. But as soon as you get into these little areas, the chain of lakes with lots yep. of cabins, Always. there was deer everywhere. All over the place. Feeding on the roads, in the yards. And a couple of the guys who were from Minnesota who were up there with us and <clears throat> not, not hunters. They're like, man, there's deer everywhere up here. And I was like, they're everywhere around these houses where there's people. Right. Because the wolves don't come by the people. Not very often. Those deer don't live in the heart of the big national forest as much anymore. No. Because it's danger. Why would you? There's bird feeders and there's no predation in these people's yards. So we probably saw 20, 30 deer yeah, standing the alongside biggest problem, the road feeding in the shoulder. Biggest problem those deer have are, are uh, people driving cars. Mm -hmm. You know, pass I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to get ripped apart. Right. <laughs> Crazy, man. So, yeah, we'll see how things progress. You know, it's definitely, like I said, it's an uphill battle right now, but I'm confident that hunters can come together and really define what they consider conservation rather than letting these politicians do it for us. Absolutely. Yeah. It's sad that we get these broad stroke, you know, um, you mentioned like we just look like the bad guys out there and all this stuff. And it's sad that that's the case. And there's, there's um, some hunters that don't, make our job any easier for ourselves too, you know? So there's that side of it. And then you consider the cats and like the bobcats and so forth. Like that's so close and akin to a house cat that people like draw this line of familiarity and cuteness to it. And they just think, well, you can't kill that. That's like Fifi over there. You don't kill Fifi. It's like, well, that bobcat can eat you alive. <laughs> you know, you kidding me? Like, if you had one of those loose in your house, how fast you'd call animal control to put it up because it, it'll, it'll eat Fifi, okay? Like, it's not the same animal. Right. Um, but yeah, people I mean, are killing these majestic creatures and they just, they don't fully understand that there's conservation happening, you know, because there's a tag and a season and so forth. Yeah. 
Well, and California is the perfect example. I hate using that as an example, but, you know, their mountain lions are, their population is growing quite a bit. Um, you know, unfortunately, the two Brooks brothers that were attacked recently and, um, you know, one of them passed away, like, and that was in Sacramento. I mean, that's not necessarily out in the boonies, but, you know, it's a, it's a busier city. So what they don't do in management just proves that that just simply letting them do their thing doesn't work. What kind of dog you got there? Oh, sorry. She's a blue tick coonhound. She's all upset because she's in the back. <laughs> blue ticks, they, those, they go for a while. Oh, man. She's awesome. She's a mountain dog. She does every shed hunt with me. She does every hike. She's awesome. That's cool. Those dogs have a lot of stamina. They oh, yeah. For a long time. Once upon a time, I had a bloodhound. And I think I took that dog for a five mile run. And he was barely, he was like, I'm just warming up. <laughs> I take my boxer for a three mile run and it looks like she's going to die. Really? <laughs> so it's just, I, I, my experience with the hound dog was like, man, that thing can go forever. Cause he's, they're so tall. I don't think people realize how big a bloodhound is. They're a very large breed animal, much bigger than even like a boxer or like most labs. And they're mm -hmm. like, so he's just barely breaking a sweat, trotting along. Like he wasn't running. He was just kind of walking fast. And for five miles of that, he was just, Barely phased. It was crazy. It kind of dragged me through one of the runs I did once and helped me get a good time. It's <laughs> like, gosh, oh, you your pace dog. Often. Yeah, it was great. <clears throat> so uh, I can hear the hound barking in the background. I figured that's what it was. Yeah. 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 She, did, uh, she did a hike with me just the other day. It was uh, 13 and a half miles. So she's, she's about it. She's got them long legs like you talked about. She's young still. She's only two. So she hasn't filled out quite yet. Um, and she's still kind of figuring herself out. But man, she is just a great dog to work with. Cool. How, like what's on the, what's, what's, um, I don't know what question I want to ask here, but I don't know what more can we do as outsiders? Like most of our listeners, I'm sure we have a few in Colorado, but like the folks that aren't from there, like what, what else can we be doing? What ought we be doing other than just like being good stewards, being responsible on social media, not looking like jackasses, like treating each other fairly and kindly. What else can we do from a legislation standpoint? If anything, with some of that other bill you had mentioned that just came, like, we don't know when it's going to, come to fruition but they're they're working on another one they keep answering these vague bills right yeah i mean essentially the biggest thing is education teaching people and trying to help them understand why we do it how it benefits not just us but potentially the environment um you know there's so many examples of elk herds and things like that that don't get managed enough and then they have to increase tag allocation because they're just not being able to sustain, you know, the food source because there's so many of them. There's so many different projects and um, obviously Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation does a lot as far as education is concerned. But uh, yeah, that's the biggest tool we have. Talk to people, help them to understand it's not just about the shoulder mount on the wall. It's not just about the rug over the, the chair or whatever. I mean, there's so much more ingrained into hunting, again, as a lifestyle than just slaughtering animals. Um, that's the biggest tool, even for people that don't hunt. Uh, that's why I love taking first time hunters. A friend of mine, actually, that's a, a, you know, a part of our group, Harnessed Adrenaline. He does a lot with CPW and uh, he does essentially what is um, their um, mentor program. So he'll take people that have never even hunted before, literally just got their hunter safety, maybe just got their rifle, have done maybe a little bit of shooting and he takes them out and he kind of helps them and teaches them as much as he possibly can. That's a huge avenue to get people into it, to help them understand on their own two feet, what it takes, what we go through. It's not every single person is out there dropping animals at 900 yards and hooping and hollering and this and that. I mean, there's so much more to the spiritual aspect of it to be one with nature who have to learn and adapt to all of the different variables that go on and to be able to think on your feet to be successful. So I, think, um, I have a question for you that I, I think you're going to have a good answer to. And I'm asking you because I want to hear your answer to spar and train myself to answer this question. Cause it's not one that I think I would answer well yet. Um, <laughs> For the, for the folks that might argue the non-hunters, maybe the anti, but more the non, that might pose the argument of like, well, you, can't, you enjoy, can't you just enjoy nature without hunting? Like, what about camping? What about hiking? What about bird watching? What about photography? Like, why, 
why you can that we we as hunters talk a lot about the intrinsic value of hunting of well it's connecting with nature it's being outside it's like yeah, you can do all that stuff without killing an animal so i'm playing devil's advocate because i want to have a good answer for that question because <laughs> it it is a decent question but i have i have my own answer to it i'm curious what yours is and maybe you guys too derek and greg yeah you know i mean i would say it's uh it's like a it's a primal drive that all of us have in us we all love drama drama tv shows drama movies horror <laughs> movies everyone loves that there's a level of intensity ingrained in the human dna um that it just wants some type of not violence right but some type of uh, excitement uh, an adrenaline junkie type of hit and it gives you that it just it's it's again it's you against that animal understanding that that animal's entire job is to survive and if you are going to go out and be successful you need to be primal as easy as it is you need to be gritty you need to be tough you need to be able to understand that that is taking a life it's not something to play with um there's like i said it's it's so spiritually in tune it, you can enjoy nature nothing's wrong with that i love hiking i love fishing all that um, camping especially, but that also doesn't necessarily play into keeping that public land public. Um, obviously hunters through tags and, and ammo and all that stuff actually buy into, you know, the land and to keep our CPW officers um, out there working it, making sure that there's investments to research pro projects and things like that. So um, I would try to pitch it to people in that manner Yes, it's absolutely great to go out with a camera and take pictures, um, but you also aren't getting the same benefit, I would say, as as just sitting watching them come by you as you are when they're on full high alert in that complete survival mode of you're not going to get close to me. I mean, elk bow season, in my opinion, there's nothing like it. It is probably the toughest hunt that you can be on, and it will really test you, your ability, your mentality, uh, a thousand percent compared to, again, just going to S's Park, driving around in your car and watching the elk run down the street. So. That's a good, there's a rigor, rigor to it, to, to hunting that doesn't exist. Maybe photography, if you're like, a, like, like a, that's what you do for real. And I think of the guy from that movie, Walter Mitty or whatever. Oh yeah. The snow you know, leopard that's, guy. that's a different <clears throat> level that's not most people are just picking up a camera to go walk around the trails the moment as a hunter the one thing that i always find fascinating is you're looking for the the game trail off the main person trail mm -hmm. and as soon as you you can spot them as hunt as a hunter you you know that's all i see is game trails when i'm with my family hiking with my kids i'm like we're gonna go down this trail and it's this adventure that you embark on the moment you step foot off the the main trail when you start going on these animal trails and you start to like go through thick stuff, down things, over things, this exploration happens to get close to the animal. In my mind, just being outdoors and observing them, it's always cool, but you're right. There's a different, you're, there's a different, I don't want it, to, it is adrenaline, but when you know you're about, to, when you're ambushing something, there's something else happening there chemically that I think is wired within us to do. And when you get, it does give you a higher level of respect for the animal. You get to know it more intimately. Um, when you cut an animal open and you, you field dress it, you have a respect for where food comes from in a different way. You're connected to it, like literally <clears throat> to some degree versus being so far removed. There's something to that. I don't know what that argument looks like or why that's important, but it seems like it should be important. One might argue that, well, that's why civilization and society has gone the way that we have, so we don't have to do that. But someone's freaking doing it. There's butcher shops. Like, you don't want to see that shit? That's gross. Exactly. But you're consuming it. So, like, yep. you should see it. And if you're a part of it, it's it's actually, when I say the word intimate, like, understanding the animal's anatomy, not wearing gloves and getting your elbow in there and, like, pulling things and ripping stuff. and Like, it's not that disgusting when it's this intimate interaction that's happening. It's a bit spiritual almost. It's, yeah. it's no, not, butchering is cold and heartless and just slopping and shopping. Go, it's clean. I mean, it's not clean, but they're precise about how they do things because they don't want anything to go to waste. It's commercialized. Like I'm not going to cut up an animal. Like as you saw with the Turkey, 
Right. <laughs> There's going to be some waste there or the, the, the many of the deer that you've helped me with, Greg. You mm -hmm. know, if, I'm not that great, but I try to be and I, in, I uh, enlist your help so that I am a better steward of that. Um, but just interesting arguments. And I think you guys have stuff to say. I'll shut up for a minute here. Well, I think <clears throat> the main difference there is those other activities get you into nature. Yep. But hunting makes you part of it. You're part of the food chain. It, yep. That's the intimacy. That's freaking quote right there, it's, Derek. it's like, well, you're sitting in a tree stand, and I've done this a thousand times. When I was younger, anytime I heard anything, I would get that adrenaline rush, right? Oh my God. Get stuff. excited. And as Squirrel. I got older, Whatever. I can watch deer now easily. But as soon as you decide, even you know, a doe, a little, as soon as you decide that you're going to harvest that deer, then it starts like you're heightened all of a sudden it's a totally different feel the adrenaline it is literally like nick was mentioning it's almost like in your dna that hunter is there and like as soon as you make that decision i'm not just watching but i'm going to partake in being one like something else in happens this you. it's a totally and that's why you get that feeling after you've harvested an animal that can't be matched anywhere it's a, it's a fight it's or like flight feeling in you yeah it it and it's there i, I think it's in ever... everyone they're just a little bit afraid to unlock that and they don't know what it looks like. So that's why like the education part, I like, have you guys ever been a in a fight Avenue? You guys been physical fights, mm -hmm. right? Same feeling almost. Yeah. Like if I'm just going to spar with a punching bag, I can go punch all day long. The moment I know I'm going to have to like hit another human being, I start to like, lo like <laughs> lose control of my extremities <laughs> in a weird way. You're like going outside. It's, it's like, Whoa, what is happening? This is getting weird. Like I know I could normally throw a punch, but now that I'm going to hit someone, like, I don't know that I can. That's the fight I'm or flight. I'm not sure it's going to happen. It's a fight or flight instinctual thing that takes over. And it's, I don't know if that's what we're addicted to here or what, but like there's something to it. And it's very special and unique. And I think it's something that most people like, I think if you don't experience that, you're probably a little bitch. Like, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a very negative way. I really mean, oh, like, uh. I really do mean, yeah, you're probably it like a pretty you're, negative one. You're probably like, a little negative. you're probably like, a Nancy, or <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing myself any justice no, you're yet. Not I'm, helping I'm gonna get there. there. I'm gonna get where I'm going with this. But you, you are the, you're, you can't handle adversity really well if you've not dealt with something like that. Yeah. I think your your threshold for adver adversity is super low. Like your feelings are gonna be hurt really easy. You're gonna right. give up on things. Like life is hard. You're a victim. I think when you, gosh, I really am not doing a good job here. Eh, but if you're if you're a hunter there. and you've challenge yourself against odds against weather against you know tumultuous terrain and you've taken animal you've you've you feel dressed it you've dragged it out you've carried it out and then you've cooked it like you're tougher now <clears throat> it's like satisfaction. you just start you generally can't. you you got some you got some grit you you rolled your sleeves up you did something you accomplished something like in the modern world in society the people that would say well you don't have to do that why should you because you don't have a good sense of accomplishment otherwise I don't know. Carpenters have that. They accomplish things. They have challenges in their day, their, their, their day to day. Like maybe they're not a hunter, but they probably are a little bit harder than most or plumbers or, who, you know, tradesmen. And I think the, the keyboard folk of the world, the, um, the knowledge workers probably crave hunting more than maybe the other, the other guys. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe well, it's funny. Out of my ass like for me, I always get people that are like, Oh, well, I don't like hunting and I don't you know, want to take part in it. And that's fine. That's your choice. But then as soon as I have elk in the freezer, they're like, can I get some jerky? Can I get some burger? Well, <laughs> so you're okay. Still that concept of being okay. If someone else doing what is essentially the dirty work, as yeah. long as you don't have to be the one to have to handle that. And reminds, that, that's, that's, remind, reminds me of like the hunger games. To some degree, like you have this elitist class that's like, I'm not going to go into those fields and pick yep. that stuff or do these things or hunt that animal, but I want to eat all the best stuff and do all the best things. Like, exactly, you have the best meat. That's elk. I feel like what's better than elk? Can someone, is there some, is there a better meat than elk meat? What would it be? Bison's not my opinion. Good. Yeah, I mean, oh. bison's awful good. Okay. But I do love elk. Whitetail's not you, bad. You either. can't go hunt bison though, right? Like yeah, it's a very limited draw for that tag. Um of the things you can you really hunt. Gotta, yeah, it, openly. it's it's not elk is up here. Yeah. Elk, yeah, elk is attainable. Bison is I would say a once in a lifetime. Salmon opportunity. is up here in the fish world. Elk right. is up here in the game, mm -hmm. wild game. Yep. And venison's great, but it's no elk. Yeah. Right? Like it's 100%. not. No. I think so to that end. Yeah, Nick, you've kind of aligned yourself with some folks, from what I understand. You've got, you guys got your podcast and whatnot. Like, tell us a little bit about the uh, Harnessed Adrenaline and the folks that you've kind of partnered with. Yeah, what are you doing yeah. with that? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So that's uh, my buddy, Charles, actually, I consider him a brother. We've known each other for, I think, 22, 23 years, um, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, the whole nine yards. And uh, he kind of asked me if he wanted to start something up like this as an education and outreach to really show people, uh, you know, again, a different side of hunting than just what they portray us as. And uh, thankfully, we've brought on a couple other people that are tremendous to the to the team. JMO, like I mentioned before, he does the uh, the guiding for CPW. Um, we also have Ian, who's a uh, cast and blast guide um, up northwest um, outside of Glenwood. And then Charles and I, um, Lane and and uh, my buddy Cookie. And uh, we all kind of touch on everything from, again, the shed hunting, waterfowl, small game, uh, upland bird. I mean, anything that we can do in Colorado, we take part in. There's not much of a uh, an off season for us as far as it's concerned. And that's the other beautiful part of hunting is there's so much to experience. You don't have to just focus on bow hunting elk in the rut. You, you know, there's of course deer, mountain lion, bear, pronghorn, um, but then even small game, you know, coyotes, great predator management. And then you get into the birds. And I mean, waterfowl has been a huge um growth for me it's a completely different hunt sitting in a blind laughing being loud you know you don't have to be super quiet although uh i do catch myself looking up a little too much and i'm sure that causes some birds to flare but you know that and even in there there's so many different species that you now have to educate yourself on okay well you can only get so many of this so many of that um don't shoot these it just it it offers a huge again, opportunity to learn and educate yourself beyond what most people know and understand. And that is our biggest tool with uh, Harnessed Adrenaline is just trying to pitch the the outside um, portrayal of hunters and uh, how we can change that to benefit everything going forward. So. And how do you, where do you like, how often are you guys recording episodes? Where do we find them? How do we follow that kind of stuff? Yep. So, uh, at Harnessed Adrenaline on Instagram, Harnessed Adrenaline on Facebook. We have www.harnessedadrenaline.com is our website. And uh, we do podcasts Thursday night, usually are uploaded either that night or first thing Friday morning. Um, you can find those on Spotify. They're also on Apple. Um, we haven't gotten to the YouTube side of things just because we don't record uh, any of the video. But we're, uh, we're working our way towards that eventually. We're all kind of spread out. So I'm pretty far southwest. Um, Charles and a couple of guys are like Grand Junction area. And then we have Glenwood and then Denver. So it's kind of tough to get everyone together together for, you know, once a week. But, um, you know, it's just more so that, okay, you have this to offer. Let's talk about that. They had a podcast recently on fishing primarily. Um, you know, we were able to do a podcast at the Colorado Hunt Expo and, um, you know, just talk about random things and have different people on like you guys are having me on here, which I appreciate. Um, so it's just, uh, you can find us pretty much anywhere. I mean, like I said, at Harness Adrenaline on Instagram, especially, and then all of our individual pages are all linked there, everything that we have going on and what we're doing. So very cool. Cool. That is cool, man. Four of you doing a podcast. I can attest to having three of us. It's hard to get everyone in the same room at the same time or virtually or otherwise. And everyone's got busy lives and it's cool that you have a dynamic group like that, that that can speak to different things. I think that's a nice collection. It's an, I wouldn't say or maybe it's eclectic, but uh, I don't actually know the definition of that word to be using it properly. <laughs> so someone just commented yeah. about the Blanco tequila and maybe you want to pour another one because I actually do enjoy it, Greg. Good. For the you. other one is not as good as this one. I, I don't know if that's true. That's subjective. It's got more... I don't know more something to it than this one's a bit smoother. The blue bottle that you see in front of us is a lot smoother than the the other one that's uh, in here. So, um, wow, you really did a healthy pour from oh, just yeah. trying it. I thought you were just take a sip. Now you're stuck with it for a while. It takes me a while to try things. I've got to really <laughs> get a handle it's on like it. My wife. <laughs> it takes me a while. Holly will like. I remember at our old house, I found like some cabinet thing that i refurbished i sanded it down restained it painted it white put it in our kitchen it was like a nice island thing it was be more cabinet space and it was really nice to have and we put it in the kitchen she's like i hate it i don't like it there she walked out came back 10 minutes later she goes oh, i do like it there actually it just takes me a little while to like take get used to things i gotta see it a few times like that that was the weirdest thing in the world that still happens to this day so she might need to have a tall pour to get to like something to come back 10 minutes later. Like, you know what I do like to keep Five, six, eight, nine, ten sips. I think I'm going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> how's, your, how's your throat like it? 
<clears throat> uh, yeah, we're rocking. I'm ready to sing a song. Yeah, the alcohol is doing <laughs> it. Yeah, there we go. Just strip it down. You don't want to hear me sing a song. <laughs> no. Ask my kids. They'll tell you. No, none of us in here, I think, would be. I mean, I don't know. You know, uh, Nick, maybe you're a great singer, but I'm not. And I don't, I'm not, not going to even ask Greg. No offense, Greg. It's, it's fine. Never pegged you as a singing type. No, it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, I wish we would have had a couple more days uh, in camp together down in Texas because uh, it was really yeah. good to meet you and Cookie and chasing those hogs at night with the dogs. was That was quite an experience. I liked it. That yeah, was, was intense, man. What was y'all's favorite memory at the doing the hog hunt stuff? No one Probably got one with the, the bow, right? No. No, no. So Cookie got his first. Actually, he ended up shooting two. Um, I didn't end up getting any, which I was fine with. I've got too much meat in my freezer between elk, deer, bear, everything. Um, so I wasn't too upset about that, but I mean, honestly, the first night was just amazing. It was so funny when, when, uh, everyone showed up and we just got to, it's kind of that, like you expect it to be a little bit awkward. We're all meeting each other for the first time type of thing, but it just clicked. It was so funny. We couldn't stop laughing. I know Jonas was laughing his butt off and we were laughing at him when uh chad squirrel peed on his back i mean <laughs> golly what happened? Just, the, uh, chad the had a, with. Yeah, yeah go ahead nick yeah chad he uh he rescued a squirrel he's a firefighter down there in texas he ended up rescuing a squirrel and uh yeah we were it was climbing all, all of us having a good time and then all of a sudden Jonas is like, my back feels wet. And sure enough, there was just a little tiny pee stain <laughs> on his back. I mean, just so dang funny. Yeah, that's cool. That's got to be stinky piss. And then sadly, those guys left before we started racking up some pigs. Uh, so they had to drive back to Colorado. I think you had some shed hunting stuff planned you guys were doing. So uh, yeah, getting ready. Short lived, but hey, we'll have to do it again next year absolutely i'm always willing to travel you tell me when to show up you tell me when to show up for whitetail sheds bro i'm there there we go cool uh nick you had something about a triple with with hush for an okay yeah um, i mean let's end on a on an okay note yeah <laughs> yeah an okay note um yeah the triple is actually obviously on their their uh, youtube page and everything like that and that was at a crazy crazy hunt three bulls in one night matt jordan and eric all three of them knocked down elk and uh that was a long night they ended up going back in i think the next day or the day after with horses um to finish everything and get all the meat out but that was an intense situation of you know the third season hunt was kind of weird there wasn't a lot of snow um you know the water wasn't really frozen as far as in the creeks and stuff so we kind of went up high basically at tree line located these bulls and then um Eric made a, a, an absolute amazing game plan to get us close into him. We had to do a little bit of driving and hike over this, uh, this ridge that was essentially 13,000 feet, drop into him and just wait for him to come out of the, the tree line. And then, yeah, they hammered him. I mean, it was, it was, I keep calling it organized chaos because there was an absolute amazing plan put in place. It was executed perfectly, but it was also chaotic keeping up with who's shooting what bull and where <laughs> they're going down. And, um, yeah, that was crazy. And then to top that, we went on a uh, four season cow hunt, a bunch of us and shot four cow elk in 24 hours, three cow elk just on Thanksgiving morning. Wow. So, what part of the story feels like an okayest moment? <laughs> because it sounds like everything went great. I think he's saying it was all I'm okay. Waiting, I was waiting for the punchline of like, oh yeah. And then, Something you know, one happened. of the elk fell down the, ho- the hill and took one of the guys out or like. Yeah, right. Uh, no, it just no. sounds great. What, what am I missing? I, I don't know, man. Last year was a, a a dream to say the least. I don't know why everything, it seemed like every single hunt came together. It started out with Jonas and I credit to his energy and what he put into it. Um, you know, it started out with his bull and then it just progressed from there. I mean, it was unbelievable the year that we had as a group last year. It'll be hard to top. Cool. So what, are there any moments uh, you know, in the back country that like shit got squirrely or like it was an oh shit moment where you're like, oh no, I forgot whatever, or we got to do this or this happened. Like what, how about yeah. one of those moments? <laughs> Absolutely. No, there's the, there's plenty of times more. So it's like you get back into a drainage, you know, you're six, you know, five, six miles back. And uh, again, that weather in Colorado is no joke. When it turns, it turns fast. And if you're in the high country, any time, even in second season, you can get snow and that can go sour very quickly. 
um, there's plenty of situations where we're walking out and it's dumping. Um, my bull that I shot in 2020 actually had, um, we, I shot him at three, we broke him down at five, but by the time we got him out, it was almost 11. And uh, he actually was only about a mile from the truck. It was a foot of snow on the ground, dumping about a half an inch, you know, pretty consistently. Jeez. And uh, yeah, that was rough. We had three people and my buddy Cookie and I took two quarters each, front and back each. And then um, we had a friend of ours that helped us out carry a bunch of scrap meat. And it was literally me just dragging the head behind me to a certain <laughs> point and then leaving it as close as we could to the truck going to the truck, dropping off what we had, and then going back up for the rest. Um, slick walking the entire time. You know, that can get super sketchy. You got to watch your feet, all the doubt, the blowdown and things like that. You just, you can't mess around. Sounds awesome. <laughs> I, I like, I mean, I'm the guy that I, I always tell people, don't, don't follow me. I will inevitably pick the, the path of most resistance. And I've said this before. It's not because I'm a badass. It's because I'm a dumbass. Like, <laughs> there's a difference, but that's the way it ends up going every time. And I look back, I'm like, no, no, don't, don't follow me. This is, a... I once in Oregon, we were going to Cannon Beach with my cousins and we had a cooler full of stuff. It was all heavy. We park and I'm like, all right, I'm going, I'm going this way is the fastest way. And we, we go through all this shit down this like gully and it's all these like big tumultuous rocks. And like, there's like thistles, they're scratching us. When we get to the other side, and my cousin's like, there's a freaking bridge right there. I was like, what? I told you not to follow me. I'm like, don't follow me. Yeah. I, no, I didn't see the bridge. <laughs> like, I have a bad habit of looking at a ridge or a drainage and being like, we need to go there. And uh, just continuously walking in one direction without paying attention to the fact that we got to hike out. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool idea in theory, but now yeah. we're here. Yeah. Yep. We got to get back. Yep, exactly. It's it's already two o'clock. We're not going to be back anytime soon. <laughs> That's like last week. Uh, Penny's just riding her two wheel bike now. So we went on the first big bike ride. She went down the big hill by her house, did the brakes. Good to go. She was so excited. Dad, let's go. So we started going and every street we crossed. Finally, we crossed you know, four or five blocks. And I was like, Penny, remember, we got to turn around and go all the way back. Do your legs have enough power? And the look on her face was like, <laughs> we gotta go back. <laughs> I've been there before. <laughs> you know how many times we take bikes places and I have to carry them back? Almost every time. Every time, every time you're, I see a story, you're walking with a bike in hand and kids are running in front yep. of you. Yeah, they're like, Dad, I'm done now. I'm like, damn it. I knew this was going to happen. I'm like, we're going to walk to the park. They're like, I want to ride my bike. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> every time I have to carry your damn bikes, I got to find a system. Clark's just doing bicep curls with bicep bikes. Curls oh my and gosh. But Dane learned how to ride two wheels. What was it last week? Yeah, I saw you folks. Congrats yeah. to Dane. Yeah. Well done, buddy. Yeah. He's not figuring out the brakes that great yet, but he's figuring oh, it come. out. Yeah, that'll he's come. figuring it out. So that was a very exciting moment. That's what car fenders are for. <laughs> as long as it's someone else's car. I never had brakes as a kid. <laughs> no. Well, uh, Nick, good to meet you. Thanks for hanging out on the show. Uh, happy to follow you guys and your adventures, what you got going on. I would. I hope there's an opportunity where I get to meet you at some point in the future. Yes. Um, likewise. Do it Absolutely. I appreciate it big time guys. And yeah, you ever come out this way, we'll definitely get you onto something. You just let me know when you're coming. Cool. Rock on. Well, uh, I'm going to end the live broadcast and, uh, yeah, the, if you want to stay on for just a minute here, we can just debrief for a quick sec and we'll all go on with the rest of our evenings. Cool. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Have See a good you. night. <laughs>